And I think it's fair to say that supernatural agents have been part of the human experience for at least 30,000 years. Across all ecologies, all cultures, all living conditions, all epochs, one of the few constants of the human experience is the invocation and the postulation of supernatural agents. So why, why is that the case? One possibility is that supernatural agents are real. Maybe they're real. <laughs> Another possibility is that they're not real, but they perform some vital function for human groups and human individuals, or they help us with healing and with anxiety levels. But what we're seeing all around us now in the current modernized societies, you know, people losing traditional religious orientations left and right, I mean, it's ubiquitous. So if that evidence is correct, that they perform these vital functions for human groups and human individuals, then a natural question arises, what happens when you stop believing in, you know, supernatural agents? What do you do then? <laughs>So it's important to define what we mean by supernatural agents since it plays such a central role in religious consciousness, at least traditionally. So a supernatural agent in general is an agent with special superhuman powers. They typically are disembodied, but not always. And the crucial thing is that they know what we're thinking and desiring. They have powers to heal and powers to curse. They tend to set up standards that human beings are expected to strive towards. And they tend to put human beings in a servile, petitionary stance. So we approach them with reverence, awe, fear, and all kinds of ceremonial rituals. We're always saying, please give us blessings and help, and then we'll sacrifice to you, we'll worship you, we'll organize our lives around you, what you find when you start to study the attributes and powers of supernatural agents, in particular in relation to individuals, is that the agentic sense of self, the executive self, gets diminished. So a natural question arises, why? Why do the supernatural agents want that? And why would we go along with it? What benefit, if any, do we derive from that process? When we relate to a supernatural agent, there's a lot more at stake than when we relate to an ordinary agent. You know, um, our, our entire lives are in the hands of our loved ones, in a sense, it's true. But when we relate to a supernatural agent, when we really believe that they're real and that they can confer blessings or curses on us, then we gotta approach them with due safety procedures in place because we give them such power over us. We need these guardrails to relate to supernatural agents. So a big question that um, comes up when you're studying supernatural agents is, is a set of brain activity patterns any different when we're relating to a supernatural agent versus some control agent, like a particularly significant loved one or a prominent, powerful individual? And the answer is yes. We have noticed very different brain activity patterns when people are cognizing, remembering, or imagining, or praying to supernatural agents versus interacting with ordinary control agents. The default mode network is more intensely activated, particularly the, the set of structures that we see during REM sleep. And those include things like the hippocampus and the amygdala, the default mode network, and the salience network whereas the dorsolateral, prefrontal, and the parietal executive function networks are down-regulated. So the down-regulation of those networks facilitate that petitionary stance and the up-regulation of all those social brain areas and REM sleep areas tend to activate the experiential aspects and the postulating of a superhuman mind that can read our minds. Now, a question comes up about when people who consider themselves non-religious or in non-religious contexts encounter what we would normally call a supernatural agent. And that's happening quite a bit these days in psychedelic experiences. The question of whether or not the same brain activity patterns are associated with supernatural agents that occur during psychedelic experiences 
versus those that occur during REM sleep or during religious experiences is a crucial question that we don't know the answers to yet. But initial indications are very similar brain activity patterns are occurring in all cases. There's a lot of sensory associations going on during these encounters with the supernatural agents. After studying these supernatural agents, both in psychedelic contexts and in standard experimental neuroscience protocols, the question comes up about their ontological status. Because people who experience them, even people who claim they were atheists, they're saying, I experience them as absolutely real entities. They don't follow my desires or my will or my agency and they have independent effects and I believe they exist whether or not I'm interacting with them. So very healthy people experience supernatural agents all the time. They believe they're real. In experimental neuroscience protocols, nothing about what we've learned so far about brain activities in relation to supernatural agents suggests that they're mere hallucinations. What to think of them ontologically is um, an open question.